Okay, so it's uh, 12.01, so we're going to start now. Welcome everyone who joined us uh, today. Uh, my name is Natalia Markman. Um, I'm here with my colleagues, Linda Foster and Alexi Varkin. Um, and uh, our trio, um, our career service uh, advisors at York University Toronto Film School. Um, all of us were working with students um, who currently study at Yorkville and TFS, as well as um, those who uh, graduated recently. And um, some time ago, we already did a series of uh, webinars on different topics related to job searching. So now we decided to repeat some of the most successful webinars we had. And uh, today we're actually starting with uh, my colleague, Linda Foster, uh, who's a real pro in career development. And she's going to talk to us about preparing for work um, and how to get your resume into the yes pile. So how to make sure that your resume gets attention from employers and uh, you're ultimately getting into your um, interview stage and, and hopefully getting an offer um, as well. She's also going to cover a little bit about cover letters uh, and references because that's also an important piece of uh, job searching uh, process. Linda, so it's uh, over to you. Thanks very much, Natalia. This is a really important topic. I would say, you know, at least 50% of the requests that we get from students, if not more, is around these types of issues. So I have a lot to cover today. I'm going to be speaking for 45 to 50 minutes. And um, we are definitely going to have some time at the end of the webinar for your questions. Um, as they come into your head, feel free to pop them into the Q&A. And um, if anyone uh, tries to correspond with us via the chat, I personally won't be monitoring the Q&A or the chat until I'm finished presenting. So just to let you know that. Uh, before presenting the webinar, I wanted to begin with a land acknowledgement specific to our BC campus, which is the one that I am attached to. We acknowledge that the land Yorkville University operates on in British Columbia is the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples of the Kukait and Kwekwetlam First Nations. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. Uh, Natalia is going to be my tech support, more or less, uh, so I'm going to ask her to advance the slides for me. Can you please uh, go to the next slide, Natalia? Thank you. So here's a little bit about my background. I bring 13 years of experience to this field. I've advised in that time, I would say between 11 and 1200 clients in career transition. And that has been primarily in the nonprofit sector. I had a few contracts in the post-secondary environment before joining Yorkville, but not too much. Uh, certainly getting my feet wet with that in the last year. Uh, so as you can see from all the bullet points, I'm certified to administer and interpret quite a wide range of career assessments. And I'm also what's called a certified career development practitioner. Uh, plus, I have a master's in adult education. And I used to be an entrepreneur for about 12 years. So I worked as a business advisor with entrepreneurs at the startup stage for six years. Next slide, please. So we at Career Services use this wonderful uh, presentation engagement software called Mentimeter. If you've gone, been to our webinars before, you've seen it. Um, basically, this is a chance for us to give you a chance to uh, engage with the material and so that I can check in with you to see your situation, your understanding, that kind of thing. So uh, grab any device at all. It can be on your laptop or a tablet or your phone and enter in the website www.menti.com and enter the code that you see. Okay. All right. So the first question is, do you have a resume that's ready to show to employers? Uh, yes, no, or perhaps you're not sure. So, so far we see a couple of people answering that yes, they have one that is ready. Uh, what about the rest of you? We have one person saying no, and that's very normal. And somebody else saying not sure, that's pretty normal too, actually, because um, it is a real learning process to discover what Okay. 
All right. Oh, we have those brave people who are saying no. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Uh, okay, most people don't. So the numbers are changing. And again, that's not at all surprising. Yeah, and that's what we're here for at Career Services, by the way. So um, I'm going to be showing you everything you need to know, but also I'm going to be inviting you to reach out to us for some one on one help. Okay, next slide, please, Natalia. So I recently came across a really interesting article and it said that recruiters care more about cover letters now than before the pandemic. Now this was from a survey of 334 hiring managers. So I think we can put our faith in that. And half the respondents said that this is now more important to them. And I'm gonna be showing you what goes into writing a great cover letter. And just in case you weren't aware of the importance of a laser targeted, high quality resume, this next quote puts it into perspective. Employers spend an average of five to seven seconds the first time they look at your resume. So I want you to think about that for a moment. On average, employers get maybe around 250 applications when they post a job. And it's likely even more than that during times of high unemployment, like we've seen on and off during the pandemic. So that means you have about six seconds to make it into one of three piles, the yes pile, no, or the maybe pile. And I'm gonna show you how to increase and maximize your chances of making it into that yes pile. Next slide, please. And then we have another quote. This one is from an international recruiter. And a lot of people aren't sure about the purpose of reference checks or, or just how important they are. So she says references can help a hiring manager who's teetering between two candidates, affirm a gut feeling or possibly provide insight into a question mark. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's the agenda. As you can see, I'm going to pack a lot into this session. <clears throat> First, I'll review the three most common resume styles, and I'll show you a checklist for each one of them so that you can get an idea of which one would be the best choice for you. And if you end up deciding that a functional or a combination style resume would sell you best, then I recommend also watching my other webinar called Writing a Resume When You Lack Experience. And that one is available on our career portal, plus our Yorkville and Toronto Film School YouTube channels. And don't worry, I'm going to share the career portal link with you a few slides from now. We'll also examine some of the key steps in developing targeted resumes and cover letters, plus how to manage yourself with respect to what's called applicant tracking systems when you apply for jobs online. And also you learn about how to handle reference requests. Next slide, please. So I found this quote by a gentleman named Richie Norton, and it's very relevant to our topic. He says, when it comes to getting a job or client, congruent value is aligning the employer's need with your value add. In other words, there must be a match between what employers want and what you offer. That's congruency. And this needs to be your focus at every step of your job search, not just your resume and your cover letter. Next slide, please. All right, so let's get into resumes. <clears throat> One style is called a functional resume. This is also known as a skills-based resume. And this is the most common style for new grads and career changers. So as you can imagine, we work with a lot of students on functional resumes, mostly as a matter of fact. Now, the one that most people know about is called the chronological resume and that focuses on your work history. And although some of the sections in the functional resume are similar to the chronological style, the difference between them is that this one focuses on your relevant skills as opposed to your work experience. And all of you who don't have any relevant experience, you have a lot of skills to offer, so you can still sell yourself. Keep in mind that the skills you decide to feature in your resume must be the ones that the employer is actually looking for. And that's what we mean by relevant skills. And again, that's what we mean by a targeted resume. You're gonna hear me saying this over and over and over again in this webinar, because that's, if you remember nothing else, that's the one thing I want you to remember. 
So for example, it might be great that you have excellent computer skills, but if you're going for a counseling job, that's not going to get an employer's attention, obviously. They'd want to see that you're skilled at um, building relationships. They want to know that you have empathy and um, that you're a good listener and, and that sort of thing. Now, it's not that you don't include your work history. You do. But the work history section in a functional style resume consists of a simple listing of your positions uh, that you've held the employers that you worked for and the employment dates, but without mapping out any of the detail in that section. So I'm going to go through the criteria that make this style a good choice. And you see that in the second column on the slide. So this is a good choice if you have little to no experience in your field. I bet you most people are in that situation. Maybe you have work experience, but not in this career. We probably have a lot of people in the audience with that situation as well. Although you lack experience, you have the skills required to do the job and you've used those skills in other areas of your life. So in your volunteer work, in your personal life, with your friendships and your family, perhaps you have some gaps in your work history or you've changed jobs frequently. And either of those can be a red flag to employers. And of course you wanna downplay that. So if this format seems like the best fit for you, you can learn more by watching the recording of the webinar I hosted last year called Writing a Resume When You Lack Experience. And that's available on our career portal under Preparing for Work and also on our YouTube channels. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next one is called a combination resume. That one is also known as a hybrid resume. This is probably the least common style. A lot of people have never heard of it. And as the name suggests, it's a combination of the chronological and the functional styles. So like the functional resume, the focus is on relevant skills, but the difference is that these are featured under each of your previous jobs, as opposed to being described at a detailed level within this section called skills. Uh, this style includes a fully developed work experience section, as opposed to a mere listing of your previous jobs as per the functional style. Then within each job, you would emphasize the skills you use that are relevant to the job you're going for instead of the duties of the job. So let's go through the checklist again in the center of the slide. This would be a good style if you're in the early stages of your career with anywhere from one to three years of relevant experience, which is considered minimal for most jobs. And maybe you've had that experience with just a few employers and yet you have a solid track record. Or perhaps you've graduated or you're getting close to graduating, but you haven't had many jobs, period. Uh, this also works well if you're changing careers or changing industries. So for example, I switched from the nonprofit sector to the post-secondary sector. And as I've been discovering in the past year, these are totally different worlds. And when I was applying for this job, I used a combination style and obviously it worked very well for me because I'm sitting in front of you delivering this webinar. Um, this style works well if you have no gaps in your work history because you'd be featuring your jobs in reverse chronological order and providing a detailed description of each. As you can imagine, if you have gaps, these would be much more noticeable in a combination style resume. So if you have gaps, you may want to choose a functional style. Again, for more on this, see my other resume webinar. The link is at the bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. The last style is the one that you're probably going to recognize. This is the chronological style. This style has the usual headings, including objective, profile, education, and work experience. And sometimes it includes other optional headings like volunteer work and hobbies. And the focus of this style is on work experience. This is where each of your jobs, both current and previous, are listed in what's called reverse chronological order. So you start with your most recent job and you work backwards in time to show your jobs uh, in the past. So again, the column in the center shows when this is an appropriate choice for you. So here's some situations where this one's a fit. When you have many years of experience in a particular career that you're targeting now, especially when you can show progression. 
uh, where you've worked in one specific industry for different employers. In other words, there's a pattern that an employer can make sense of. Uh, when your work history is consistent with little to no gaps. So I've shown you all these three checklists and hopefully that's helped you to get an idea of which resume style to use for your situation. Next slide, please. All right, speaking of which, um, having seen those checklists, what do you think fits your situation? Functional, combination, chronological, or maybe you're still not sure. What do you think? You can answer directly in Menti. Okay, so we have combination, chronological, functional. It looks like most people are saying combination or functional, and that's not at all surprising to me. Um, and occasionally we see chronological style, and usually people don't know. <laughs> okay, and Emma says she's not sure. Okay. Uh, yep. So the majority are saying combination or functional. Again, that is not at all surprising. It's exactly what we see when we work with students. Yeah, okay. Um, and we can show you step-by-step step how to do this, by the way. Next slide, please. So this is a screenshot of a resume of someone who was looking to progress in her career in the pharmaceutical industry. As you can see, if you scan through both screenshots, it has the usual sections. It starts with an objective statement. I don't know if you can actually read that, if it's big enough, but it's worded in a way that sells her. That's followed by a profile, and that summarizes all the key relevant points she has to offer. This section is very important because often it's what employers read in those first five seconds. And I will be showing you what to include in this section. Then this is followed by her professional experience. As you can see, she's featured her industry experience since 2002, which is actually quite far back and not the usual uh, scenario. And, and I'll explain that to you in a little while. If you look closely at each job, you'll see she's listed several accomplishments for each one. And also a little bit later, I'm gonna explain to you why this is a good idea. The last section is formal education and special training, where she lists what she's completed that's relevant in her industry, leaving out what's not relevant. So Michelle's resume tells a story. It shows uh, progression. Um, you can see a lot of commitment there. Um, I feel like the way it's written shows passion and ob obviously too, we see ambition. It's laser targeted to her goal of rising to a management role in the pharmaceutical industry. By the way, this is a real person. I helped her with that resume and she ended up getting the job. Notice how this resume packs a lot into two pages. Now there's often confusion over how long a resume should be. Although there's different opinions on this, some people will tell you one page is the limit and you'll find that advice on the internet. The most common expectation among employers and recruiters is that a resume should be no longer than two pages in length. Of course, one exception to this is people who are applying for positions in uh, careers like um, higher education, um, jobs in the medical field uh, or academic, um, also scientific positions. Uh, so people in this situation can create what's called a CV. Um, that's a curriculum vitae and there's no page limit for these. They can be quite lengthy. Next slide, please. So in the next few slides, we will look at all the different sections that can be included in a resume. And for each section, uh, you can see I've got a couple of columns there uh, in the table on the slide. I've indicated whether you should include it regardless or whether it's optional. And that, and that depends on things like what employers prefer to see and they'll spell it out for you. It depends on whether you have enough space and whether it adds anything relevant that helps to sell you. So I want you to think about every line on your resume as valuable real estate. For those of you who live in Vancouver or Toronto, you know how expensive real estate is. There's no room for anything that doesn't sell you on your resume. Each page of your resume should include a header at the top, but don't actually format this using the official header feature in Word. 
And this is because if you apply for any jobs posted on online job boards, which I know that you do, the computer algorithm, the applicant tracking system doesn't recognize information in headers. Here you would use a font size larger than the body of your resume. Make sure to put your name on both pages, um, but the difference is on page one, you feature your contact information. Um, you can put in your email and your phone number and the city and province where you live. You don't need to put your street address. On page two, you would include your name and page number, and that's it. Now, links to your social media profiles can be included in your header if you have the space, but only if they relate to the position and showcase your relevant talents. So for example, you're not gonna put Instagram unless you're in the creative field and you wanna showcase your work. Of course, LinkedIn is a good one to include for almost everybody. If you happen to have a website related to the career that you're going after, then include a link to that. But don't include social media icons if you're applying online. And what I mean by that is those cute little um, symbols like an envelope for email and so on. Because screening software, again, it doesn't recognize fancy graphics. So if you're applying for any jobs online, just plain text, the simpler, the better. Uh, next, your resume objective. This is a short statement where in two to three lines, you summarize your career goal as it relates to the position you're applying for. Now, the biggest problem we see on resumes with the way that people write career objectives is that they're way too generic. And that makes them useless and therefore a waste of that valuable real estate. Uh, so uh, in case you're curious, it turns out that 50% of employers want to see an objective statement, which um, leads us to conclude that 50%, it doesn't really affect them one way or another. They're not looking for it. So carefully research the job and write a very targeted objective that sells you or else leave this piece off your resume. And you're probably wondering, well, how do you do that? But I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes. Next is a profile that's also sometimes called the highlights of qualifications or the summary of qualifications. And that's a summary of your relevant background and skills, again, targeted to the job. And it can include the items that you see listed in the tips column on the slide. And this section can be written using bullet points or a short paragraph between three and five lines. Again, employers typically read this section first and they might do their first screening by only reading this section. So it's so important. Next, education. Include your post-secondary education, credentials, and any relevant certifications. Again, making sure to only include in education what's relevant to the position. You don't need to include your high school diploma because if you've completed a university degree, then it's assumed that you finish high school. Next slide, please. Okay, skills is next. It's really important to research what skills employers are looking for, especially if you don't have experience, even more important, and match their language with the ones that you can offer. In a chronological resume, the skills are usually featured as part of the profile section, and therefore they wouldn't need their own heading. But in the functional and the combination styles, these would be more prominently featured in their own separate section. You should be showcasing a combination of your hard and soft skills. So you might be wondering, what, what does that mean? Hard skills are the ones that are very specific to particular jobs, like, uh, for example, using certain types of software. If your field is technical or doing intake interviews, if you're a counselor. Um, and soft skills are the ones that transfer to any job. So for example, uh, that would include communication, uh, organization, time management, leadership, that kind of thing. Next is work experience. Under this section, the guideline is to feature only your last three jobs or the past 10 years, unless your experience prior to that is relevant. Remember our example of the woman in the pharmaceutical industry going back to 2002. That's because her experience um, dating back to 2002 was very relevant to the position. But if that's not your situation, then use that rule of thumb, last three jobs or past 10 years. Uh, in this section, you only include content. So in other words, writing out the details for positions that are relevant to the job. 
And if you've chosen a functional format, again, this section will simply be a listing of your previous jobs. And I'll show you an example. If you're trying to avoid showing gaps in employment, you can include jobs that are not relevant. But what you would do there is to limit these irrelevant jobs to a listing of one or two lines just to show the chronology of your work history without giving details for those jobs. So other information included on many resumes can include industry awards or industry memberships. Again, these can be important to include if you have space and if there's a link between this information and the position you're applying for. Hobbies and volunteer work can be included if you have space, but remember that your resume is about that real estate and selling yourself as the ideal candidate. So if you don't have enough space or you can't link your hobbies or your volunteer work to the position, then it's best to leave these ones out. Now, if you've done volunteer work and some of it is relevant, whereas other positions are not, then again, you only feature their relevant positions. I keep using that word and I'm hoping that it's gonna stick in your brains. Next slide, please. All righty, so as promised, here are a few examples of objective statements. These are samples of students targeting an energy manager position and a counseling practicum placement. The first column shows the typical way that people write objective statements. And this is what we often see when we review resumes. So let's look at the first one. A position as a manager, climate action and energy for Fortis BC. So uh, the way that this is written is really common and what it's doing is it's stating the obvious. And the place to mention this is in the very first paragraph of your cover letter. So remember what I said earlier about thinking about every line on a resume as real estate. This objective statement is so general that it's a waste of space. Now let's have a look at the second column. Same job, different way of writing the objective statement. To use my initiative, research, problem solving, and team building skills to develop solutions to climate change issues and educate North Americans in how to be environmentally responsible. So this person refers to his relevant skills and the heartfelt way in which he wants to use them. Um, this is actually a really powerful statement and it sells him instead of stating the obvious. And it appears right the, at the top of his resume, so it grabs the employer's attention right away. And then the second one on the slide is another example of this contrast that I'm trying to teach you. Next slide, please. Okay, the next section where I want to show you some samples is the profile section, really, really important. Sometimes this is labeled as summary of qualifications or highlights of qualifications. And as I mentioned earlier, most employers read this section first and their first screening might include only reading this section. So that's why it's really critical. Remember what I told you, they spend five seconds the first time they look at, at your resume. So how you write this can literally make or break your chances to get them to read on. So you're probably wondering, what should you include in this if it's so important and how long should it be and, and questions like that. So there's two styles you can write this in, either bullet points or a short paragraph. And if you use bullet points, I suggest maybe five to seven is about right. And if you're writing a short paragraph, then anywhere from three to five lines is about average. So here's what goes in it. Uh, it includes a number of years of relevant experience, and that inc can include your work experience and your volunteer work, uh, your post-secondary education, any relevant training that you have, um, a related accomplishment is a really good thing to include, plus your hard skills and your soft skills. And remember, again, that it must be laser targeted to the job. You should be customizing your resume for each job you apply to. Uh, don't worry, this doesn't necessarily mean that you need to develop a new resume for each job, but you may have a few different possible jobs that you want to go after, types of jobs. Uh, that's a good strategy, actually, and you should tailor each version of your resume to the specific type of job that you're applying for. And this profile section is one section that you're likely going to be adjusting for each and every job. 
In column one, we see an example of someone targeting a counseling position. She has used the bullet points format. And then the next one is an example using the short paragraph format. And this is a woman who changed careers from an IT consultant to a holistic nutritionist. Can you imagine? Like, that's a vastly different uh, job, big career change. And again, these were my clients, and, and both of them got the job. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm curious to check in with you, which of the following resume sections is not optional and therefore you should include it on your resume? Awards and memberships, objective statement, profile, volunteering, or hobbies. What do you think? Not optional. Oh, we've got somebody saying profile. Uh, we've got so far profile is winning. Um, objective statement has a few votes. It seems to be splitting between uh, objective statement and profile. Somebody saying volunteer work. Somebody in the chat is saying awards. Okay. All right, people. Well, there's only one of these that is not optional on your resume and should be included, and that's the profile. Uh, that's the part that employers read in those first five to seven seconds. Uh, the other uh, sections are optional, depending on if you have space and if it's relevant. Okay, see how much we're learning? <laughs> All right, next slide, please. Uh, when writing the content within each job of your work experience section, I highly recommend that instead of just listing your job duties, you think about how you stood out in each of those jobs and write about your accomplishments. I mentioned that earlier. Here's why. First of all, if you just write a list of your duties, which by the way, 99.9% .9 of people do, this reads like a job description. And you know what? It's really boring. <laughs> Secondly, no two people do the same job in the same way. Um, Natalia and Alexi and I, each of us has a different approach. We have different strengths. So it makes no sense for this part of your resume to look exactly the same as your colleagues who has the same job. You want to instead write about the unique ways that you made a contribution. And these are called accomplishment statements. So that's confusing for a lot of people. You're probably wondering, well, how do I do that? So on the right hand of the slide, you see a screenshot of an article. And this is linked in our resume resources on the career portal. It's a really good one. So here are the main points. Know the difference between a duty and an accomplishment. A duty describes what you did and an accomplishment describes how well you did it. So if you add some metrics, in other words, some numbers, you give the employer some important context that would otherwise be missing. The next point is, Make a list, just you know, basically go through each of your previous jobs and volunteer positions and ask yourself questions. Things like, what did I do that was above and beyond my normal duties? How did I stand out? When and why have I been recognized for a job well done? And if you read this article, you'll see there's a whole bunch of other really good probing questions to help you to recall your accomplishments. And, you know, if you don't have much experience, that's okay, because you still have accomplishments from other areas of your life, and you can use those on your resume. Uh, next, paint the picture with numbers. Add as many facts, figures, and numbers as you can. By quantifying your accomplishments, you really show um, the hiring manager, uh, you know, you give them a picture of the level of responsibility that you had. And make sure to add the benefit. A lot of people forget this part. Um, tell them what the results were. Because this demonstrates not only what you're capable of, it also shows the employer how they're going to benefit from hiring you. And I'm going to show you some examples in the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so here we go. These are from my own resume. In the left column, you see a very typical style of listing duties under each job. So let's take a look at this contrast that I've been trying to tell you about. The first one, <clears throat> written in the duties style, reads, deliver dependable strengths job search program to cohorts of unemployed clients. So what does this tell you about me? Basically, it says that I completed this task with a specific audience. But what if I did a terrible job of it? What if none of the clients found work? 
So this might allow an employer to check off a detail on their checklist of qualifications, but guess what? Other applicants going for the same job might also have this on their resume, and it may or may not make them curious to meet me. So instead, I wrote it like this. Upon delivery of dependable strengths through strategic partnership with Dress for Success, an immigrant fly, client sorry, found work six weeks post-program in her profession of origin after nine years misemployed as a nanny since relocating to Canada. Oh my God, I was so proud of this. This was an unbelievable result. Six weeks after this job search program, she got an accounting position and that moved her out of the survival job scenario she'd been in for nine years. And that's such a common scenario for new newcomers to Canada. Can you imagine how an employer would react to reading this compared to the job duty approach? Next slide, please. So here's an example of the first step to take when you're writing your resume. This is based on a real case study. This woman was changing careers. She was a friend of mine, actually. She had been a self-employed hairstylist for 11 years, and she decided to pursue a lifelong dream of becoming a dog trainer. She completed a dog trainer certification, uh, but that's all she had to offer. She didn't have any relevant formal work experience to put on her resume. So this first step is the same for all job seekers, regardless of your situation and regardless of the style of resume that you choose you need to first get very clear about what employers are looking for. So how did she find this out, you're wondering? On the right-hand side of the slide, you see a job description that we found on the internet. You can find them too. And the process she used was to go through it in detail and highlight in yellow all the requirements that match up with what she brings to the table. So the highlighted words and terms, everything in yellow, are what she needs to mirror in her resume. And by the way, this web page was just one of many that she looked at during her research stage. And she used the same process of highlighting for all those different pages that she looked at. And then she looked for the common themes from all these different web pages, and that's what she focused on in her resume. Next slide, please. So this is a screenshot of this client's resume, which is written in a functional style. Notice the section under the profile called relevant skills and evidence of effectiveness. This is her skills section. Here she features skills clusters that match what the employers are looking for with what she can offer. Her work history, as you can see, is a single line near the bottom of page two. And everything you see highlighted in yellow directly mirrors what she found in that job posting that I showed you in the previous slide. Plus she has a lot more um, and, and everything basically matches what she found in several other job postings. Her resume was so strong that the day after she applied for her first job, she got invited to interview and they offered it to her on the spot. Remember, this woman had no formal relevant work experience. No slide, please. <laughs> Not no slide. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, the next question is, so how do you articulate your relevant skills? I just want to let you know, career services can provide you with a skills activity called skill scan that will help you with this. This is the activity that my friend used. It's an assessment that includes a list of 48 skills and for each, you give yourself a score for how well you did it, plus how much you enjoy it. And you end up with numerical scores for what are called your motivated skills. And based on these ratings, you can prioritize from your strongest to your weakest skills. And this can help you identify what skills to feature if you're developing a functional or combination resume. Plus, it helps you to know what to talk about in job interviews when they ask you what your strengths and weaknesses are. Remember, though, that you will select the ones to focus on based on what's relevant to the job you're going after. Next slide, please. All right. So tell me what you think. Why is it better to list accomplishments than job duties? This one is going to make you think, I know, so it might take a minute to get a uh, few answers to this one. To demonstrate excellent performance, perfect. Yeah. 
makes you stand out from the crowd. Exactly. You got this. To show how you shine, perfect. Duties are boring, accomplishments are enticing. I love it. Uh, shows what you are capable of, perfect. Yeah. I am so happy to see these answers because it shows me that you get it. Okay. Gives them a reason to choose you over someone else. This is fantastic. Okay. Uh, oh, one more. It demonstrates that you have done what you have done and what you can achieve. You have perfectly stated this audience. I love it. Attracts the employers more. Yes, I can see you're on board with accomplishment statements. <laughs> All right, next slide, please. If you're applying for jobs online, and I know you're doing that, <laughs> you need to know how applications get filtered because this can help you to write in a way that helps you get screened in. Uh, many employers use um, these online application systems. They're called applicant tracking systems or ATSs to screen. And these are algorithms that make candidate screening more efficient, but unfortunately they also remove the human element. So common features of ATSs include requiring applicants to set up an account and a profile with your name and contact information, your work history, uh, your education, your skills, and you can usually upload a cover letter and a resume, but you might also have to input this information directly in their platform. It's a lot of work, but the point is to get your information into the ATS so that it can can scan for what's called keywords. In other words, you have to use the same words that the employer uses in their posting because the software is going to look for that. So you can see a number of tips listed on the slide. You can read through that list, but I wanna emphasize the last point, which is please don't rely on online applications because the vast majority of jobs are never even advertised. Most people are shocked to hear this. And ATS has also removed the human element. It's really easy to get screened out on these systems. 65% of jobs are found through relationships. So a good rule of thumb, is to spend no more than 20% of your efforts on online job search and the other 80% to build and nurture your network to help you find work. Now, of course, we have a recorded webinar on this topic. It's called Finding Work by Building Professional Relationships. You can find it on the career portal under Preparing for Work, the same link I shared with you earlier, plus it can be found on our Yorkville and Toronto Film School channels, but the cool news is that my colleague, Natalia Markman, will be representing this fantastic webinar on October 28th. Uh, so look for it in your inbox and social media. She's very passionate and very knowledgeable about this topic. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, now we're gonna move on to cover letters. Your resume is formal and it is unfriendly, but your cover letter, it explains why you're applying for the job and you use real world examples of your experience. So, so what it is, is a chance to show your personality and to show some excitement. It's a way of showing also that you understand the job. And employers can easily detect how much effort you put into your cover letter. So then make a good effort on this. They can take time, but it's worth it. So there's import, some important do's and don'ts to keep in mind. First, make sure to laser target your cover letter because generic cover letters make a really bad impression. And that's probably the biggest mistake that we see at Career Services, thinking you can just use the same cover letter for every job, don't do it. Part of laser targeting is to focus on what the employer needs and show how you can meet these needs. Next, if you were referred by someone the employer knows, then you mention this because it can increase your chances of getting interviewed. Um, also, one tip is to put in the effort to find out the hiring manager's name. You can do this by searching their website. You can look under About Us or Meet the Team. You can look them up on LinkedIn. Um, and you can even make a phone call to the company asking for the name of the person who will be reviewing resumes. I did that once. And you know what happened? that hiring manager wanted to talk to me and she did a spontaneous pre-screening interview on the phone. Uh, so try these bold moves. All, although it might seem like a small detail to just look for that hiring manager's name, what does it show? It shows effort and it makes you stand out. You'll need to use the standard business letter format. And I'm gonna show you that. 
Also make sure to proofread it and proofread it and proofread it. And you might even get someone else who has excellent English or better English than you to proofread it for you because having errors leaves a bad impression. So some things to avoid are don't skip the cover letter. It's really important in competitive times like this. Don't go over one page. And lastly, again, a common problem that we see, don't just copy and paste from your resume. It shows a lack of effort and it doesn't show your personality and employers get turned off by that. Next slide, please. So here's a breakdown of what should be included in the content. A cover letter should be no more than three or four paragraphs. Ideally, you want to use the same header at the top of the page, same font, that kind of thing, um, same as, as the header on your resume and the same font as your resume, um, you know, at where that includes, the header includes your contact information, your name, because when you use that same kind of style, it gives a consistent professional look to your application. It's kind of like personal branding. So in your first paragraph, you include the name of the position you're applying for and say why you're excited about the role. The second paragraph should feature your relevant background and the overall theme of it should be, here's what you need and here's what I offer that you need. This can include details like a key accomplishment and it should also include your relevant skills. Make sure to use keywords to help you get screened in. Plus, you can help them to understand your resume by adding in names of recently held positions where you use those uh, skills and you achieve those accomplishments. And then the third paragraph is the closing. Here you can provide one last statement summarizing your fit for the position, why you're uniquely qualified, and make sure you ask for the sale. In other words, mention your availability for an interview. Say that you're looking forward to hearing about the next steps in the process. And I'll show you a template in the next slide. Next slide, please. So here's what the standard business letter format looks like. Um, we have this template that explains what should be featured in each section and also shows a proper formatting. And again, this is available from Career Services. It's soon going to be featured on our career portal, but if, uh, if you can't find it, just uh, reach out to us by email, we'll send it to you. Next slide, please. Uh, here's an example of an excellent cover letter. You may not have time to read it, but again, I can provide this if you email me. It's someone applying for an assistant visual manager position at a women's boutique. And it follows the format that I showed you in the template. Uh, she has lots of relevant experience and it's beautifully showcased. And she shows a lot of passion and enthusiasm. Um, next slide, please. All right. So... Uh, which of the following statements about cover letters is false? Shows your personality and enthusiasm targeted to the job. Copy and paste from your resume. Focus on what the employer needs. Mention who referred you. Yeah. <clears throat> Copy. Which of them is false? Yep. You guys are getting it. Don't copy and paste from your resume. We've got 100% accurate responses in the mentee. Oh, you're such a smart audience. I love it. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay. And then the last part I'm going to cover is about references. I just have a few things to say. When employers ask for references, they want names and contact information of people, not reference letters. Letters belong in your portfolio. Employers want to talk with people. They want to ask probing questions about you and your work. So a call to the HR department is not a reference, unless of course someone in HR worked closely with you. Employers conduct reference checks to verify what you said in the interview was true. They wanna get an outsider's perspective on your performance because past performance is the best predictor of future performance. And they also wanna know what you were like to work with because for virtually all employers, fit is near the top of their list. So here's what you do. Contact your references to let them know you're job searching, tell them what kind of job you're looking for, and ask their permission to use their name. You'll need to make a reference list for employers, and you should give your references a heads up after you had an interview that went well. It should never be a surprise for them to receive a phone call asking for a reference. You know something? I've sometimes received unexpected calls for reference checks. 
And because I didn't have a chance to prepare, those references were not very strong. Um, I've sometimes even said no to people who have asked me to be a reference because in those cases, I honestly didn't feel I could find positive things to say about the person. So this is why it's so important to request permission. Your references will want to know more about the job that you've interviewed for. You can email them the posting and you can even request what you'd like them to emphasize if they're called. You should provide at least three references and it's okay if they're from another country, by the way. The employer's part is to request the references, don't offer them until they ask. When they do, it's usually a sign that they're considering offering you the job. Then the employer proceeds to contact your references, usually by phone. They typically have a set of prepared questions. If an employer is having difficulty deciding between a few candidates, the reference checks can help them figure it out. And also, an employer might have particular instincts about you from the interview, and this could be positive, but they might have doubts. So when this happens, they might ask more probing questions so they can learn what they need to about you in order to decide. Next slide, please. We're almost done. I'm going to give you a chance for questions in a couple minutes. So who should you ask to be references for you? They don't have to be former supervisors. They should ideally be someone who knows your work. So obviously your manager or senior leader of your department would know your work, but so would your colleagues. They should be people who support you and they should be people who can easily be reached. Some people are impossible to reach. In some cases, you may not be able to or you may not feel comfortable to use your previous manager. Um, working relationships are like any relationships in life. Some of them are positive, some of them are not, and that happens. And in these cases, you should be able to explain why not. So you can say you lost contact with this person or that other people know you work better. In a situation like this, you can use former colleagues, you can use instructors or a manager where you volunteered or even former clients. The bottom line is to create a list so that you can control who they contact. Next slide, please. Okay, so here is a template that we have that shows you how to lay it out your reference list and what information should be included. Again, you can ask for that from Career Services. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, I think this is my last question. Who can you ask to be a reference for you? Check off all that are true. Instructor, volunteer program director, former manager, close friend, coworker, client, customer, family member. What do you think? Okay. So far, the only one that is not being checked off is family member, and I would agree with that. And that also applies to close friend. So close friends and family members are the only ones from this list who should not be provided as references, and that's because they're too biased. Um, and uh, you wanna make sure to include people who can comment on, on your work. Okay, so the final announcement I want to share is Career Services has some really thorough resume resources and tools to help you create a strong resume. In other words, one that really sells you. And you can find these on our career portal. You've got some graphic images of what that looks like on the slide. And the website is listed on the slide. And under the Preparing for Work tab, you can find information on resumes, cover letters, and references in addition to interview preparation, plus advice on how to make the most of your online job search. So we launched the career portal in August. We're currently working on a version for Toronto Film School. Uh, we regularly update it. So please check um, our site uh, regularly. Okay, two slides. Please forward two slides, Natalia. Next one. Great. So <laughs> here's, here's all our info. Uh, I've given the address of our career portal. Um, you can reach out to us at career services at yorkvilleu.ca or career services at torontofilmschool.ca. Uh, our team is available to do one on one coaching with you, whatever you need. Okay. So we have five questions, five minutes for questions. Um, fire away. Uh, let me know what you would like to know. Maybe you can stop screen sharing, Natalia. Well, Linda, thank you for uh, running that fantastic uh, webinar. It was full of a lot of really useful information, uh, especially when it comes to the different types of resumes that you can still make one with limited 
experience um, or when you're switching to a different career, that there are avenues to make yourself look very powerful. Uh, if anyone's interested in the webinars, like Linda said, they are uh, posted online, both at our career portal uh, and on the uh, YouTube pages. If you have any questions, uh, please post them in chat and we'll be happy to get to them as soon yeah. as we can. The chat or the Q&A. Yeah. There's a few questions in the chat that came up on where they could find this information. I, okay. I told them along the way, but there's also the information at the end. Okay. Did you put the uh, Career Portal website address in the chat by any chance? I did. Thank you so much, Alexi. I really appreciate that. Yeah. No problem. I'm going to repost it as well okay. um, in case anyone missed it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We have a question in the, in, the, in the Q&A. Do we just email career services for one-on-one -on -one help with e res? Yes, absolutely, you can email us. Um, again, it's at either career services at yorkvilleu.ca or Toronto, uh, career services at torontofilmschool.ca. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reply that you'll get from us is first we'll send you a link to our intake form. That's just a necessary hoop that you need to go through and it's pretty quick. And um, then you write us back to let us know that you have completed that and then we can start our work together. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and you have access to our services from any time of registration to six months after you graduate. And our services are entirely free to all students from that. Um, yeah. So if you are looking for help, just send us an email. We'll be happy to schedule that Zoom meeting or follow up with you. I love uh, Maria's question. Do you only help fresh graduates or also more weathered graduates? <laughs> that's super cute, Maria. So that's an excellent question. So not only is it free, but we support students up to six months past your graduation date and it's still free of charge. Yeah, you can reach out to us at any point um, during your studies up to six months afterwards. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Yeah, we've got two more minutes for questions, people. So, you know, give, a, give us a, a whirl. Okay. So this information should apply to us after we finish our program at either Yorkville or the film school and are looking for a job. I think I just answered that, right? Yeah, both during and after and both Yorkville and Toronto Film School. Yeah. Yes, because this information also applies if you're looking for a part-time job during studies. You still need to have a resume and a cover letter and the references, right? So it doesn't matter what kind of job you're looking for um, in your professional field or just a part-time gig. Um, you know, all this information is very important because you're still competing with other people for, for a job. You still have to apply and, you know, go through the process. So I think it applies yeah. at any point of time. Yeah. And you also have to keep in mind that while you're a student here, you are building on your uh, career experience as well, that the tasks that the uh, your professors assign you are direct experiences in a field. So if you are just going through academics as your main source of experience, it's a good idea to have a resume started so you could keep track of all those assignments that you have to done or those uh, projects that you're working on to potentially use that as experience in your resume as well when you don't have the the employment side, but more the academic side. Yeah. Okay, I see two more questions. One of them is, any chance you can help students abroad of different universities? So, um, you know, you can access our information if you're not part of Yorkville or Toronto Film School on our career portal, that's a public website. You can watch our videos on uh, YouTube. However, we don't provide that one-on-one -on -one support to people outside our institutions. Uh, next question, can I give references from people who live in another country uh, but are not fluent in English? Ooh, that's a tricky one. Um, if they're fluent in the language that the employer speaks, for sure. Um, if they're fluent enough in English, then yes, they don't have to have perfect English. And yes, they can live in another country. These cover letters aren't necessary for applying to the film school, are they? Um, what do you mean by applying to the film school? You mean uh, applying to get into the film school? I think they mean um, to the creative field. Um, doesn't matter which field you're applying for. You still need to have a cover letter. If yeah. it's a creative field, if you're applying for graphic design, video game, 
video game design, film production, you still need to have a cover letter. It might look a little bit different in terms of layout because you are you are in a creative field, so you you still have to demonstrate creativity through your resume and the cover letter as well. Um, but you know you still need to provide it, so don't think it doesn't apply to you. Okay. And I see a question in the chat from Bemnet uh, says, what is the best way for someone with zero experience to get into the creative field, such as graphic design? So you know what, that's an excellent question. I, we're at time, we're just one minute over right now. And that's something that I think is probably gonna be better answered by Natalia through a, through a one-on-one -on -one or through email. Natalia, would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. But if, um, if to give a very short answer, um, volunteering, it's always a great um, option um, to practice your skills. Also, while you're in the program, you are practicing your skills through, uh, through a lot of assignments that you're, you're completing in graphic design. Um, so you can actually use your um, assignments, capstone project, your final projects on your resume as your experience. Um, because when you finish school, it doesn't mean you have zero experience. You already have experience because you had to complete the group assignments. You had to complete uh, personal assignments and all of that involves graphic design work that you're doing. So you're still finishing school with some experience under your belt. Um, it's just, um, how you demonstrate it on your resume and cover letter and that we can talk one-on-one. -on -one, so feel free to, um, email me and we're going to talk about that. Okay. I think it's time to wrap it up. So I've really appreciated the participation in the Menti and love to see such enthusiasm. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for attending the webinar. And I really hope that you'll be uh, coming to Natalia's webinar on October 28th. It's going to be fantastic. All right. Thanks, everybody.